Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 13, titled Down For The Count Part 2. I'm sad. I'm sad that we're here, that we have to close out this story arc and we have to finally say goodbye to everything Zito. No, we do not have to say goodbye to him. We can always remember him fondly in our hearts. Yes, we will. Just like the ending credits of this episode. Oh, that's too sad. I can't even think about it. (laughs) I I appreciate the fact that they did the little montage at the end. But I also found it funny that during the beginning funeral that that that's probably not him in the casket no uh, no we don't get it's a... not, not. <laughs> Ooh, apparently he was gone he was gone yeah he was like i'm it I'm, that's it i'm done get the hell out of this place the episode originally premiered on january 16th 1987 and it's directed by R- richard compton who we talked about last time it's written by dick wolf so this is the exact same people who did the first half are now doing the second half of this series before we get started I could check in and see what's going to each other's lives and guys i have to say i'm sorry we missed a week it was just no warning just all of a sudden we missed a week for go with the heat and right in the middle of one of the best two-part series arcs in the history of miami vice we had to take a break in the middle and that's all on me i got sick last week and i've actually been sick for quite a while now for, for a full week now so we had to we had to say that we had to skip an episode and and go uh, unannounced with missing an episode. So just saying out of the gate, sorry about missing one. Trying to do what we can, it's but okay. also I found I, out who shot Dallas while we were away. <laughs> <laughs> I had plenty of time during that to do my favorite pastime, which is to do nothing but watch The Simpsons. So I did that where I watched the entire seasons three, four, and five, which are you know. The greatest seasons of the simpsons anyway i used my time wisely i guess is what i'm saying i too did some binge watching first uh i was house sitting for our mother i took advantage of her hbo go to <laughs> uh binge watch my way through game of thrones i won't go into it but i also <laughs> binge watched the first six episodes of the tick on mm. amazon which i really enjoyed I thought it was fantastic. When we were younger, I grew up watching The Tick. I did like the cartoon and the original live action, but it's been so long since I've watched it. Like, I don't even know if I can remember everything that happened. See, and and I think the people who didn't like it, I don't think that they actually watched those two things. I think this Amazon one is better than the original one that Fox trotted out. Oh, so, and wow. It, it, <laughs> Those are yeah. some fighting words. So. Uh-oh. Yeah, it, and it falls <laughs> right in line with, with how the, the, the way the cartoon felt. I think that they're doing a fantastic job with it. I was disappointed that they only released half of the first season. It's funny that, that, that you say that you thought it was funnier and it was better because there was a lot of feedback on that where it was really mixed on the tick. And I know that in this house, it was contentious. Because Amazon does that weird pilot thing where they say, like, you know, they let people choose which show they, they want to continue on based on the pilot. And the tick was straight up against Jean-Claude Van Damme, which is a holy person. We have Jean-Claude Van Damme candles in our home. <laughs> I wish. Where we- do you get those? <laughs> uh, uh, Dom, I-, I believe it's Jean-Claude Van Damme Johnson. Well, that's the show that Jean-Claude Van Damme is making. It's Jean-Claude Van Damme Johnson. And luckily, Melissa didn't have to hurt nobody. No, I didn't. That both (laughs) The Tick and Jean-Claude Van Damme Johnson got picked up for shows on Amazon. I only voted like 500 times. That's that's fair, right? That's not (laughs) cheating. (laughs) That counts. I think we single-handedly got that show (laughs) picked up by Amazon. (laughs) And because of our investment, we're tossing around the idea that maybe we'll do a short run podcast that when John Claude Van Damme Johnson lands on Amazon video, we'll do a little episode at a time, just like we do here for Miami Vice, but just for that show. So if you're interested in that, email us, go with you to gmail.com. Let us know if you actually would like to hear that, a breakdown of, of that, because you know, this is an 80s podcast. And when you think of the 80s, the top of the list should be Sylvester Stallone, and then number two should be Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to fight on that list. No. I love both of those men. <laughs> well, let's go talk about this story and how we finish up here because we start off with something that's going to be very contentious. We're going to pick right back up where we left off with Sonny, what are you doing? And Castile, quit being an ass. 
<laughs> so. Well, that never stops. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this episode. So we open up, I know we missed a week, but I'm going to say thankfully, we open up with a complete recap of the first half of this story. So just in case, you know, remember it's 1980s. If you imagine, think back in time. If you missed last week's episode and you come in, you watch this opening montage, you're like, oh my God, what did I miss? <laughs> How could I have been so stupid? <laughs> like, I'm never going to see it. Because there was not a way to just go back and watch it back then. Miami Vice was a, mm -hmm. a groundbreaker in having uh, reruns that was shown in the summertime. So that's how Miami Vice was groundbreaking having that. Who knows when it was going to re-air and who knows if you were going to be home when mm -hmm. the rerun aired. You may never have seen this first half of this episode. I told you that when I first started watching it again, oh. when you bought it for me and I watched it all over again, I had like forgotten or I hadn't seen that episode. So I had never actually really known why Zito was gone. I just thought that they like wrote him off. I didn't know they murdered him. <laughs> and then when I watched just it, I was like, no, it. no, no, this can't be true. <laughs> he just rode off into the sunset like the end of Shane. Yeah, exactly. I never knew what happened. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. That's weird that Zito's not around. But you, you have to give the Vice people credit. This is the first time they've ever done a recap. I mean, Previously at least on you got a Vice. recap. Sure, uh, and, and it's, it's it's a cut to me because they're able to do a recap in about three minutes, and I can't do a whole episode rundown in forty minutes. So, <laughs> ouch! <laughs> it does do a good job. Like it covers beginning to end on what's happening. It just reminds us of the key points here, and the key point I have taken away from the opening montage recap is, man. They're really heavily pointing out how much Crockett really wanted this to happen against the wishes of Zito. Yeah, they're just pointing out how it's all Crockett's fault. It's Basically, all it yeah. Something tells me Dick Wolf didn't like Don Johnson at the beginning. <laughs> like, by the end of the season, he's, like, on the fence of whether or not he should kill off Don Johnson. He's like, no, nah, I'm going to let him stay. <laughs> People like him too much. <laughs> Because you feel like, he, you know, he let out murderer. Now he got one, another officer killed. He's trending down. <laughs> now, not to mention the, the what, the, the meat stroker episode. <laughs> not the meat stroker. The Don't meat bring the fondler. Fondler. The meat fondler. Thank you. I think the meat stroker is better. <laughs> When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the mortuary at Zito's funeral. Everyone is there, including Sykes. Switek says that he sees that Larry's family is there, including his six brothers and sisters, who he was really close with. It's like, ouch. It's really, it really hurts, especially how he got set up, basically, in the last episode. Like, this is this is really hurts. And then you look around at all the Vice team, and the ladies are there, and they're very sad, and, and Croc is brooding, and Tubbs looks really bored. <laughs> like, what is this done? <laughs> You know, Tubbs walks up. He's like, like, do you recognize anyone here? Maybe they don't know Zito at all. <laughs> exactly. And, and and Crockett's like, no, I don't. Yeah, because you didn't know anything about him. And then Whitek's like, there's his, yeah, his mother, his brothers and sisters. They're all over there. <laughs> and you can see at a certain point in time that Sonny's like, okay, let's get this thing on the road. I buried lots of partners. Come on, let's get this <laughs> yeah, thing done. This, I mean, I got like a <laughs> discount now, you know, I got like a punch card that with all my partners are buried. <laughs> Let me tell you how you do this. And my favorite part is Castillo acting like he gave a crap about Yes. <laughs> Larry and holding the, his mother's hand. Because hmm. clearly at the next scene, it's not the case. Before yes. we leave the mortuary, though, Switek does a attempt to give Larry's eulogy. He's only able to get a few words <laughs> in and he walks off. And you still, even though we know Zito as, as Switek's partner, we never really saw him in the show that much. But this was, I know I choked around a little bit, but this is like a really he a heavy scene to show that how close Switek and Zito were. That he calls them brother. This was the last time that we're going to see that, where they kind of have that dynamic. And obviously, Stan's going to take it very personally. It comes off throughout the rest of this episode. But just like that last reminder that how close they were, because we're going to find out real fast that no one else on the vice team seemed to knew anything about him. When we leave from the mortuary, we head over to, to the precinct, and the whole team is meeting with Castillo. Everyone's all upset and sad and Castillo comes walking in, all nonchalant, and I almost expected him to say, like, hey, who died? <laughs> <laughs> that, I think that would have been better than what he said. <laughs> Why are the sad faces? Because <laughs> he says, quote, keep your grieving in private. He's we like, have I a know job you're hurting. to do. I know you're hurting, but keep your your grieving out of here. I don't give a crap about anything. I have a mustache yeah. to wax. Don't tell me about your problems. Honestly seems annoyed through most of this episode. 
that people are upset about Zito being dead. I know. And the only thing I kept thinking about, I was like, maybe it's because he processes things differently. So he goes home, he puts on his Speedo, he does his ninja <laughs> stuff. He does a few <laughs> he, laps in the ocean. Yeah, he puts his Speedo on, he sits down, he has some Thai food. I don't know. He eats I, something spicy, I, maybe that gets it out. I don't know. <laughs> As soon as she said that, I unfortunately visualized him in his speedo playing with nunchucks. <laughs> yeah, right. Like where he sits, where he's like looking out in the ocean in that episode. And he just yeah, exactly. Speedo. I was like, did he really need to be like, in a speedo for this? Yeah, like playing with nunchucks, staring at the sliding glass door at the ocean. <laughs> Well, he's got more bad news, too. He says that the report from the crime scene only shows Zito's prints on the syringe. So as of right now, it, they're calling it an accidental suicide by overdose. Obviously, it doesn't sit well with Stan. He's very angry because he says that he knows that he's been clean. He knows that Guzman has done this. But Marty's 100% by the books. Like, there's no other evidence there. If you, it, it, This looks like he OD'd. And then, as the vice team all starts to leave the room, the ladies are still there. Sonny's still sitting at the head of the table. Switek walks the long way around the table. And as he walks by Sonny, he says, good call on Guzman. I hope it was all worth it. And, and it's like, ouch! <laughs> <laughs> the the, the oh. dagger. <laughs> He Sonny, gets burned a few times in this episode. Yes, Sonny just sits there. And it's like, the truth hurts, doesn't it, Sonny? Mm -hmm. so, sometimes it's, it digs a little deep there. The best part is the ladies don't deny it. They just sit there it's, and like, put their heads down like, oh. Crockett leaves, and that leaves the ladies in. Oh, normally, I'll skip this, but this is kind of weird, where then Trudy tells Gina, sorry, that she took a guy home last night because she didn't want to be alone. And Gina asked if that made her feel any better. And Trudy says no. And I don't know what the point of I don't know what the point of that was and why this was why that moment was left in the final cut. I guess what made it weird because... to me is that you think that Trudy and Gina would have been together because they're like mm -hmm. friends and they're partners. And if you were lonely, why didn't you just have Gina come over? I don't know. <laughs> Before we leave the precinct, the IA is there and they're ready to interview Switek. There's a lot to unpack here. What's that got to do with the price of eggs? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Why does he say that? <laughs> what's, with the, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Or his brother died of drugs, too. What? <laughs> By the way, th this episode is cram packed with fabulous one-liner lingo. Oh, God, yeah. Um, <laughs> There's so much to get and to on I, that. <laughs> I took the liberty to write almost all of it down. So just be <laughs> bear with me. We know a couple already <laughs> off the top of our heads, I'm sure. So, uh, once again, what does that guy do with the price of eggs? <laughs> we learn here that Zito was a recovering alcoholic. He had been sober for five years. But IA immediately throws that out. Says like, hey, did you know that he was an alcoholic? Did you know that his brother had OD'd? And so I text like, yeah, but he's a good guy. And he gets really close-ups of one of the IA officers and says... Why don't you just go to hell? And then he storms out of the room. Yeah, because they said, did you did you know that your partner was involved in illegal narcotics? And then he's like, go to hell. Next, we head over to Zito's apartment. And Crockett is talking to the landlord, says that the rent has been paid up through the end of the month. There's no signs here that show that Zito is a, is a junkie. No one knew about it on the yeah. team. Stan has got his back. He's paid up on all his bills. Like, there's nothing that shows anything wrong here. No, but the landlord, like everybody else, doesn't really give a crap. He's, he's kind of got that attitude like, hey, you're here to take his crap, right? <laughs> okay, but that's a lady, though. It's just so clear. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, like, did you think that was a man? <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> yeah, it's a lady. I, I... <laughs> Inside Zito's apartment, they find Zito's snow globe collection. They, they see his fish who they should know about because he had his fish in the episode made for each other. It's mm -hmm. been a thing for a while. And they're genuinely, the duo, are genuinely shocked to learn things about Zito. It's like, did you guys ever even ask? Do you know anything about him? No, they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> the landlord was holding his mail, though, and in that stack was a certified letter he had never opened. So then Crockett and Tubbs take off to go to the post office. And they find out that it's a letter from Moon that includes Guzman's gambling book with a great note that also... <laughs> says i stole this from the chili pepper head <laughs> i love that even in death he's still a racist 
<laughs> comes back from the dead with another racist remark. <laughs> Crockett and Tufsey that's written in code. It's it, it's it's a cipher. And they say, well, we can't do anything about this. Let's take it to the ladies, a.k.a. the other real cops, the, the, the real cops at the precinct. Yeah. And have them take a look at it, see if they can figure it out. They didn't even try to figure well, it out. Yeah, they don't have their Captain Midnight decoder ring. That's what that is what Tub said. He's like, here, <laughs> here I am without my decoder ring. <laughs> Over at Guzman's, Sardoni is talking to Guzman. He says he can't find Sykes anywhere. But then randomly, Sykes just shows up. <laughs> it makes him look like he didn't look very hard. Screw you, Sardoni. <laughs> <laughs> Did you check the driveway? <laughs> <laughs> the front door? No, he's there right now. Sykes comes in. He says he wants to sign win or lose. He just wants a shot at Walker. And so he's willing to sign with Guzman. He's his, he's his only bet right now. So next we head out to fabulous Las Vegas. <laughs> they look so fabulous in their clips. <laughs> Two men are talking. They think that Guzman is moving in on their turf. So the man that's doing the most talking, the head, the mob boss, his name is Giulini. And he is very upset about the Guzman situation in Florida because it turns out that Giulini actually thinks that he's in charge of all the gambling and hookers and everything that's happening in South Beach. So you would think maybe the YC would know about this guy, but uh, that's a different conversation. He's on South yeah. Beach. They don't have that area, okay? <laughs> uh, I, I just love how hard they're trying to be wise guys in this. Like, <laughs> hey, forget about it. <laughs> it's also a great Go quote in here. Go brains out like... Like spaghetti. Forget about it. <laughs> There's also another great quote in here where Giulini is confused to why Guzman is disrespecting him. And he says, maybe they don't teach that in Banana Land or wherever he's from. Like, what is going on with this? <laughs> and also, he does not call him Guzman. He calls him Guzman. The whole entire episode. It's like, that Guzman. Do I go on his lawn and park my car? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Turns out. That the FBI has been listening in to his phone calls. He is apparently going to try and kill this snook, Sonny Burnett. <laughs> and also Rico Cooper. <laughs> Hoopa. Which I think that should be Sonny's new middle name. Snook. Sonny Snook <laughs> Burnett. Giulini makes it clear, too. He's going to personally take care of Guzman and find out what's happening with Cooper and Burnett. Back at the precinct, the ladies walk in on a meeting. They haven't had it. Any luck with deciphering the notebook that came from Moon or Guzman's notebook. Crockett just happens to know someone named Denny Alred, so he sends them off to go talk to them. Meanwhile, Dad comes walking in, and he says that Zito's case is going down as an OD, which obviously throws everyone off. Like Crockett gets really mad. He throws something across the room. Switek, meanwhile, he sits there unmoved. He's in a trance. Castillo walks out. Crockett runs him down and says, hey, we know that Zito was no junkie, but... Castillo says, that's a whole lot of not my problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he says that, well, then you have to figure it... You, you have to solve the case in order to clear you his have name. To find more Why didn't he say that when he told him about him being put down as a junkie? If you don't want him to go down as a junkie, OD, then you have to go... You have to clear his name, basically. But, because but, but it's we can't not do anything his until problem. You, yeah, exactly. We can't do anything <laughs> until you bring me evidence of it. And then Tubbs even says like hey we know that Zito would never do needles because he was afraid of needles we we, did, we gave blood last year and he was really upset and he didn't want to do it Burnett gets a call so the phone rings he which I don't know does only one phone ring or I don't understand we still have that we've been talking about this for three seasons we have many questions about how the call patching happens at the precinct yeah and how do they know it's for Burnett like he didn't answer it he's like it's for Burnett <laughs> it's Sordoni he has a he set up a meeting with Guzman, so that's where the duo are off to. But still, Stan is still just sitting there, unmoved, sitting in that room. No one's paying attention to him. They all run off to go take care of stuff, and there's Stan just sitting all by himself like a ticking time bomb. And no one on the vice team is paying any attention to him. Someone who had just lost his partner. He's all poor, alone. Poor it's so sad. Stan. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Someone needs to get him a cat. <laughs> Out of Guzman's, Cooper and Burnett show up. Guzman is happy to announce he has signed Sykes. So they have a TV deal for now. I'm going to brief you this because the next scene is more important. When Cooper and Burnett leave from Guzman's, Tubbs is in the car and he's laying down some common sense. He's like, hey, we don't actually have a sports network and we can't broadcast any of his fights. So what the hell are we going to do next? But Crockett don't want to hear that common sense stuff. That's what he got says, into this I don't mess. give a damn. We're going to make it yeah. work. <laughs> and then Maybe shish kebab on our own sword. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yep. I told you I wrote oh, I wrote them all down. <laughs> Crockett is laser focused on clearing Zito's name. He says that, but it's in reality it's because he wants to bust Guzman. He is just laser focused on bringing down Guzman, and you see his plan at the end of this episode makes no sense, and again leads to that all he wants to do is just bring down Guzman it has nothing to do with actually clearing Zito. And you see Tubbs, he's got this look on his face like, you are out of your mind. And he even says, this could crash and burn. And Crockett says, again, I don't give a damn about that either. Tubbs is meaning like, this is, this could crash and burn and we could die. So he could kill us, basically, if we, if we screw with him. <laughs> I think Tubbs could die anytime he's in the car with Crockett. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't get why Tubbs has a transfer to another department. Is Miami that nice? <laughs> Because Tubbs doesn't care about anything. Let's face it. <laughs> they need a good detective on homicide. They can't solve shit. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> now we go out to an airport, another airport, a different airport. An airport. Because we're going to leave from this airport and go to another different airport. <laughs> a smaller um. airport. <laughs> so. That's all Miami is, is airports and beaches. <laughs> Everyone has their own personal airport, okay? <laughs> Figure that out yet. How many people own like old warplanes, though? I, I like, thought that cause... too. Like, that's really weird that that's. That makes it in almost every episode of Miami Vice. <laughs> or was it just someone on the cast owned one? So they just kept using the same one? Because, I mean, yeah. we remember Tommy Chong, his character was like in an airplane graveyard. Obviously, the Glenn and... Fry episode where they're at the airport. What, and what's Glenn the Fry one Part with... 2 where they replaced Glenn yeah. Fry with the other guy. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I was just trying to think about that. Whatever that uh, guy The guy that should have been Gary Crockett. Cole. Oh, please. Gary Cole. No one wants to have sex with Gary Cole. I'm sorry. But he can't be Crockett. <laughs> sorry, Gary. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, Gary. I got your back. You should have been Crockett. <laughs> Things would have gone much different if you were Crockett. The ladies come pulling up to the airport and a very excited Alred throws open a door. I was like, hey, how's it going? You should come on in. Come around the other side. Hey, ignore those FBI people that are following you around on, on the tarmac. Just come on in. Uh, that was Dude, the weirdest it... spot that he had, too. It was like only room for one person in there. So how were those girls going to fit With no there? lights. No light. I mean, what the <laughs> hell, though? <laughs> yeah. Dude, and the FBI is being super creepy. They thought they were hookers. That's what he said. He goes, oh, they think you, they think you guys basically... The gist of it is like, oh, they think you guys are hookers. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> oh, so th the costume worked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're not hookers right now. Offended. <laughs> yes, it's not Tuesday. <laughs> Alred is an ace crypt cryptographer. He's going to bust this book open. They want it back by 4 p.m. the next day. So this was a pretty short meeting. But the person playing Mr. Allred is actually kind of interesting. We get Chris Elliott. When I, I think of Chris Elliott, I always think about there's something about Mary. He's played a bunch of different comedies, but I'm but guest starred on a bunch of different television shows. I know, Dom, you like Groundhog's Day. He was, in, oh, yeah. he was the camera guy in that. He was also in James Cameron's The Abyss and Michael Man Alert. Manhunter. <laughs> he was also in Kingpin. He was a writer for David Letterman in the, in the 80s. That's how he got his start. And actually, he was a SNL cast member in 94. And to stick with the SNL theme, his daughter, Abby Brighty, was a cast member on SNL from 08 to 2012. Mm, and so he's actually the first it's actually the first father kid to both be cast members of snl none of the other cast members kids have ever made it wow. on the cast that's actually pretty crazy so, he's a funny guy been in some funny movies and apparently he's got a funny daughter too <laughs> well we leave alred's airport and head over to a different well, airport but before we leave i do want to point out that chris elliott's character throws a peter gabriel shout out <laughs> so not just invading my music but now invading the episodes as well <laughs> we're gonna leave all reds airport and head over to a different airport maybe it's the same airport i don't know it's a different hangar where they have the smaller planes <laughs> non-war planes where people don't live in them yeah that's, yeah. that's it. we're on that part of the airport <laughs> he's like the trailer park portion of <laughs> <laughs> it's julini he's flying in on his private jet he reams vespa who's his local man on the ground there for why he was letting guzman get so out of control and then he says i want to meet with burnett and cooper tonight and he's going to start 
laying down the law right now in, in Florida. So then Vespa and his men go out and go try and find Cooper and Burnett because now the boss is there. So you got to act like you're actually doing something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they, the, the empty, the totally devoid of life streets of Miami makes it really easy to find Crockett driving around. And we go into our chase montage of this episode, which isn't much of a chase, actually. No. No, but at first I was like, I wonder, does it count as a car chase if the other party doesn't know they're being chased? (laughs) They actually started chasing them because I think somehow, like, this is a regular occurrence for Crockett. Like, oh, (laughs) it's another chase. Like, they have no idea why these guys are following them. They're just like, oh, oh, I'm just going to start speeding around in my Testarossa now uh, because... This is the third time this week someone started chasing me. <laughs> My favorite part of the chase is that you can clearly see the police from the background got the streets closed. You uh, didn't see that. You're not supposed to see that stuff. <laughs> that ne- nothing ever happened in this episode like that. Tubbs also makes a, a comment about something about the, the Girl Scouts, but I actually I missed that one. I didn't get to write it down. But something about the Girl Scouts being really aggressive this time of year. Yeah, he said they go, maybe it's the Girl Scouts trying to deliver some cookies they can get kind of aggressive this time of the year <laughs> ha, ha, ha. of course any good chasing in the 80s doesn't end without a game of chicken where vespa then is the one that bails out and he crashes and the duo are able to get away at the precinct we also it- got we also got the dukes of hazard off, the one car the dukes of hazard off the boat <laughs> off the boat <laughs> <laughs> It was, you know, questionable driving by Sonny, but in the end, it all pays off. I mean, he backed himself into that one-way street, so it's the, 80s, the, the only way you're going to get out is to play a game of chicken. Yeah, I just love how these two cars chase them around, both the cars crash, and then it's the next day at the precinct. like As if nothing happened. Both two, yeah. two cars upside down in the streets of Miami. They were chasing a white Testarossa. <laughs> I wonder who that guy could be. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> in that next scene lieutenant castillo sticks his head out and go ask crockett like what he's been up to and i'm thinking like like they're finally gonna call him on it hey, <laughs> did you crash two cars last night <laughs> no he says the fbi is there and the feds come in and explain the whole story about Giulini and what they had heard on the recording and that they're looking for burnett and cooper and crockett says good then we'll bring them down we'll help you bring down Giulini." Ju- and the feds say, no, that's bad. You've already lost one of your own. We don't yeah. need to lose any more cops. Why would you be involved in this anyway? Why are you trying yeah. to ruin our investigation is what he's trying to say <laughs> nicely. Uh, he, he, he actually said, it, you already lost one cop too many. And my thought was, ouch. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and not only uh, another burn. Yeah. Someone from outside the department from a different state. <laughs> it's like, we all know about you, Crockett. Uh-huh. <laughs> the ladies head back over to the airport, and they're there to go ch- check in on Allred. And he greets them even more enthusiastically than he greeted them the first time. He comes running out. He says that he cracked the cipher really easily, actually. It's pr- primitive. They got lazy when it came to the end because they were getting so many bets that were building up. And that what his plan was, what Guzman's plan was, that he would build up a fighter where he'd be so good and then have them lose to a nobody, and then win on the bet. So it's actually a pretty easy system, but well over a million dollars in six months in bets. So he just does it over and over and over again. So now we're going to get to the real mob section of this get Mobbing episode. it up. In yeah, here. we're going to mob it up a little bit. We head over to Giulini's, and he's talking to Sordoni. This is Guzman's lawyer. And Giulini comes out. So how come you're so sweaty? You should come out on the porch with me. How come you're so sweaty? He gets him on the porch, and he's like, hey, so I know where your kid's your parents and everyone in your family lives i want guzman's whole life story i'm gonna let my men do bad things to your family especially your beautiful wife creep (laughs) (laughs) he was sweaty though he was really sweaty like someone had just dumped a bucket of water on him level of sweat uh, yeah. yeah, but he wasn't even getting any oh, sex. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, at first I was like, he's gonna toss him over the balcony, huh? <laughs> That's what I thought too. No, 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 it just ends with him making them cry and wet himself, or was it sweat? <laughs> he <laughs> caves real fast. We head back over to the precinct, and Castillo comes out to finally, finally talk to Stan. He says that he was gonna put him on the beach, meaning like, like you don't yeah, have to he do was gonna heavy. take him off, kick him off, but he can't. Because they can't, they need it. They need 
everyone on site right now. They can't sacrifice anyone. And Stan's like, yeah, thanks for the thumbs up, I guess. I appreciate you thinking about me. <laughs> thanks for <Dude>. there. <laughs> Marty sucks at this whole leader thing. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I can't send you home. So I guess go out in the van. Do you want to bring one of the girls? He's like, no, I think I'll be okay. And then <laughs> it, it, Swartek, it's too soon to share the van. Poor Swartek, like opens up and says, like, I just know. Isn't that where he says, like, he just knows that Larry would not rest until his name was cleared and. I just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, aww. It's okay. He just needs a hug, Castillo. Someone give Stan a pat on the back. Give him a Something. hug. No one's doing anything for him. What the hell is going on at Miami Vice? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> so now we're going to jump over to driving with the duo. And this is when Crockett kind of lays out what his plan is. That he's going to let Jelini and Guzman think that they each have a deal for this satellite sports network and basically let them kill each other. This is going to keep poking the bear and see yep. what's going to happen. Yep, that's accurate. Actually, that's exactly. Yeah, that, that is, it's actually a pretty good plan. Like, well, screw it. Let's, let's just get them to fight over us. It's a pretty so. good plan if you're not police officers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know. We have a brief stop at Guzman's. This is where the duo are off to. They hear that Gu Guzman's still hyping up that he's got this satellite deal. We head over to the gym, and now the duo are going to go finally, finally go talk to Sykes. And Sykes says, get out of here. Yeah, I know you guys are cops. You guys have been using me this entire time. These are all facts, Sykes. Thank you for someone finally saying yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Crockett says we're just here to help you it's like Sonny Sonny baby when did you think you were ever helping Sykes here you never helped him do anything helped him be disappointed you got two of his trainers killed yeah helped him lose people who cared about him while you're really helping yeah, him you, out there you used him as as bait to basically set up your operation like he had no ties to either of these guys when the when everything started he wasn't even on guzman's radar at that point no he had seen him fight once that was it yeah he didn't know anything yeah. else that was happening sykes walks off he doesn't want their help and he says as he leaves that he doesn't need their help to kill he's gonna kill guzman himself and it always bothers me they never go back to that uh -huh. <laughs> that why would well, you not like, just let that, that Seem, out there <laughs> yeah and they seem pretty okay with it they're like uh <laughs> that's good if you hey, if you do it first let us know because then we don't have to we can add an extra spoke to this wheel go for it yeah everyone wants to kill each other yeah, go for exactly. it as long as they're going to kill guzman yes. we're all right we head back to Julini's, and the new will show up and now they're sealing up the other half of their plan they got guzman oh uh, sorry they have this is the first half and they have another half so what's going to happen here i'm gonna i'm gonna put them both together they talk to Julini. they say that they have a deal to get fights on satellite it'd be clean money they're tired of dealing with quote jive yokel locals thank you tubs <laughs> <laughs> thank you tubs for the stellar quotes they're promising big money all he has to do is promote the fights Julini says he can get fighters from guzman because he won't be needing them anymore so he's all in on this then they go talk to guzman and they say hey we're not doing we're not doing business with you anymore even if you have sykes because you have Julini after you. We don't want any part of that. Julini is a bigger fish. We don't know why. We would never do business with you if we knew that Julini was involved. And so now, once again, they have Guzman, a wounded dog, forced into a corner. And they're poking a bear with a stick, trying to get these two to fight with each other. Guzman, of course, his response is, it's just a bump in the road. Let's go take care of Julini. They're going to kill. Ju He's going to try and kill Julini. And, of course, Julini is there in Miami to personally kill Guzman. Julini, man, he, you know, he's small time. I mean, can you believe the stones on this burrito? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good time now that we've got both sides beefing to talk about who our wise guys are. So Vespa is played by Robert Pastorelli. Believe it or not, he's best known for his role as Eldon Bernecki, the painter and nanny in the TV show Murphy Brown. Murphy's, he was oh my on God, there. I remember that now. He was driving me crazy. I was like, what is he from? Yeah, he yes. was like babysitter kid and do all kinds of, he was painting her house for like 10 years. He never finished that yeah. painting. <laughs> yeah, he was on the show for 10 years. So oh, see, yeah, you. it's weird saying that he's best known for Murphy Brown. You might also know him from Beverly Hills Cop 2. He was in Dances with Wolves, Sister Act 2, and his 
last movie was Be Cool. He was actually popular. He he, he had a really big uh, long run on Murphy Brown. He was starting to do movies. And then in 1999, his girlfriend, Sharman Janovic, apparently killed herself during an argument, pulled a gun out and shot herself. Wow. After that happened, his career kind of spiraled out. of. It, it, he kind of let his career go, kind of got into drugs and stuff. Well, in 2004, he died of what was ruled an accidental heroin overdose. But it wasn't that accidental, considering authorities had just reopened the shooting of his girlfriend from 99 and changed it from an accident rule it as a homicide with pastorelli being the prime suspect oh maybe it wasn't an accident that he died of an overdose wow (laughs) wow where's 48 hours mystery on this one (laughs) yeah (laughs) weird how that kind of relates to this episode (laughs) yeah i know our other goomba alfredo Gellini, is played by joe delessandro pretty much a troubled childhood more than most his mother was in prison he he lived with his dad until he was kicked out until, until he was moved into foster care ran away he made money through prostitution and in at least one instance did gay porn and nude not mo- nude modeling this is a dark until... turn for these guests oh yeah <laughs> Jeez. until andy War- warhol cast him in films the loves of ondine in 68 and another movie called flesh i didn't know this but the lou reed song walk on the wild side his 1972 hit in that song in the lyrics he refers to him as little joe he's talking about joe delessandro wow I, he did a few other things but i guess he wrote and produced his own biography should be pretty damn interesting but people must not have thought it was too interesting or he must not have done that mu- that good of a job because he's he currently manages a hotel in hollywood so joe delessandro he'll leave the last on for you <laughs> <laughs> although they're kind of a joke in this episode with like how over the top mobster they're being joe del Sandro actually does a pretty good job like he's a pretty evil bad guy in this one so in between our two scenes where we see cooper and burnett setting up both guzman and Giulini. We have a real short scene at the precinct where you see Crockett handing out numbers. Sorry, we see Crockett reviewing with the team what the plan is and that the ladies bring in the numbers. Switek just, he sees the numbers and he just zones out and you see like, Something broke in his head. That moment of Stan looking like he's zoned out makes me really confused to what's happened on this next scene. So now everything's been set up. Everyone has these numbers. Crockett and Tubbs have gone out and sold Giulini and Guzman on killing each other, basically. So now the next thing that happens is that Switek disguises himself as a deliver as a messenger and delivers a letter to Giulini and it's Guzman's gambling numbers. And it shows just how much money he was making, which Giulini says, quote, that taco was taking him for over a million. (laughs) 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 And then accuses Vestbaum being in on it because, like, how can you not see over a million dollars in a six month time period? How can you not see that this was happening? This was not that smart. He couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so the question is, why did Stan do this? To light the flame. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, it worked. No, it, he it did. Worked he he that did was... exactly what he wanted to do. He, he was pushing them to kill each other. Or but we saw Guzman. that already happen in the episode where Guzman said, Jolini's just a bump in the road. We're going to take care of him. But they and don't know Jolini that, though, right? Jolini personally fly to Miami to deal with Guzman. They didn't need this push. Yeah, but they he doesn't know that, right? He, they're not following. This is before they set the surveillance up. It's not until after he delivers that. Then he's surveilling them and listening to their phone calls in the van, right? Mm-hmm. He doesn't know that that's already been done, that they're going to kill each other. Yeah, that's true. I'm just, I'm really confused to what Stan's ultimate goal was out of this. If he's always has in mind that he's going to exonerate Zito, what he hoped to come as, was he really just hoping that Giulini was going to go kill Guzman? Yeah. And that's, I think that's what it was. And he just wanted revenge and he wasn't thinking about, he wasn't thinking straight about exonerating 
Vito, he just wanted revenge I, and he knew he couldn't go do it. So better to have them kill I each other. Also have a little, uh, I'm also finding a, uh, having a little problem with the fact that Giulini flew all the way to Miami to to kill Guzman. And then he asked the guys to find a mechanic and take care of it and then get the rubber bands wound up on his airplane so he can leave again. So he personally flew there to ask his guys to hire a hitman so that he could fly home. Yeah, I know. He wasn't actually going to do any of the dirty work. <laughs> we have a nice little segue to a woman on a jet ski in a pool. Uh, no, she's in the pool. She's in the lake, right? <laughs> I don't know. It looks an awful lot like a big pool at a mall, but it's <laughs> Sordoni calling Giolini to tell him that Guzman's put a hit out on him and that Guzman will be had it his normal operations was out of the back of a jewelry store at a mall on Bayfront. So that's where Giulini's out to head off to. And Switek hears this phone call happen in the bug van. He gets a call from one of the ladies says that they heard a phone call with Guzman, who says that he's going to go kill Giulini and Stan lies. He says he didn't hear anything on his end. Not, n- nothing is nothing. happening on his front. So then it, it doesn't take long though to to feel bad we don't exactly know how long he waited but eventually he does call the dynamic duo and give them a roughly 14 minutes to go to the mall (laughs) (laughs) luckily that donut that he had in between then cleared up his head he never (laughs) ate the donut he couldn't do it okay He went to the donut shop, he bought the donut, he looked at it, and he was sad about how him and Zito used to eat donuts together. Yeah, it, it was a maple, which was uh, Zito's favorite, and he just couldn't bear to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have this race. Guzman's heading over to a store. He's going to go check in on his business. Giolini has sent his men over to the mall, and the duo with Stan are racing over to the, to the jewelry store to stop all this before it happens. So now we have this, everyone's converging on a single point. Guzman shows up first. He calls to the back. The jewelry store which has a surprising number of people working in the back. Uh, how big is this jewelry store? <laughs> I need to know the back room. There's like 25 people on phones in the back. It's been a good day. Everything's looking great. The hitmen are showing up to, to the jewelry store. And that's when the duo and Stan come flying up to the front door of the mall. They hop out and run in. Now, Melissa, <laughs> I'd like you to point out what people got out of the cars and ran into the mall. <laughs> so I don't know if John caught it or not, but out of the duo's car comes Crockett and a really bad stunt double <laughs> for Tubbs. It's, like some bla- it's, it's a black not him. guy. It's not him. No, 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 no. It's not him. It's an old black man wearing a suit and wearing a wig. <laughs> and, <he> comes- <laughs> and then Stan. And then Stan comes out of his car. Um, I don't. I I don't know. I don't know. It's clearly supposed to be Tubbs. He pulls out a gun. He runs and hides behind a pillar. He comes out of the car with but Crockett. He's camera center. <laughs> and it is clearly not, not Tubbs. Tubbs. <laughs> Unless Tubbs ate like 20 years. <laughs> there will be a picture of this in the show notes. Yeah. I mean, you can't miss it. I made Dominic go back. I'm like, go back. You have to watch that again. He's like, okay. And then he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, so now I'm going to have to go back because I wasn't paying attention. I was too busy thinking, like, you can't park there. (laughs) Yeah, it's like right when they come through the doors, Crockett comes through the door, and then next comes (laughs) Tub Sr. (laughs) comes in after him, and he crouches down with a gun. And I'm like, that's not supposed to be Tubbs, is it? And then we went through the whole hilarity of, like, watching it ten times. So now everyone's there. They're going to go try and stop the shootout from happening, but they're too late. Guzman's getting ready to leave. Giulini's men open fire. There's a shootout. The the vice team shows up. They, they add to the shootout. Luckily, no bystanders are shot. Miracle. Is it was shot always going to end in a shootout, though. Stan goes chasing after Guzman up the stairs. Guzman grabs a hostage who's able to slip away. Stan has his gun out. He's pointed at Guzman. He's having flashes of the last moments he had with Zito before he buried him, those last moments in the gym. And he shoots and Guzman, which then sends Guzman through the glass window behind him and down to the floor below. And that's the end of Guzman, and that's the end of Guzman's entire gang, essentially. We have our last scene of the episode where we're at Sonny's boat. The team, plus Switek and Sykes are all there. They're in memorial for Zito and for ending this case. And Switek says he thought he'd never be able to clear Zito's name. How did he clear it? 
Did they? Yeah. Well, no. you know what? If you think about uh, it, they, they must have got like the attorney too, right? They've got like, he didn't die. So they've mm-hmm. got people to cooperate. But obviously, they're they're yada, yada, yada over a lot of the story here. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At, at what point did they prove any evidence that did not die of a drug overdose? I don't see how anything was proven here. One, I don't know how much the lawyer was involved in the actual of killing Zito. And two... He's still pretty scared of the mobster guy, so I don't know if he's talking about anything. Because they didn't get the main mobster guy. He got away. So, and then we freeze frame on Switek's face, and that's the end of the episode. And that's the end of Zito. That's it. No more Zito. This is a sad arc to end here. And they did close out the case, but there's still lots of questions here. And we, I think we're still not happy with how Castillo or Crockett decided to deal with this. But I think we'll cover that in our final thoughts. Uh, Let's go over and talk about the music because there is some great music in this episode. All right, John, this week we actually have a really deep music section. Someone we've talked about before, a couple of new people, one person I'll come up again in the future. So what do you got for us this week? This week was full of really good music. I'm not going to try and focus on anything too much, especially since, you know, like you mentioned, uh, we've already talked about Jimi Hendrix featured in Florence, Italy's episode with the song Up From The Skies. All along the Watt Tower, originally Bob Dylan's song, but it was covered by Jimmy in 68, about six months after it was released. It's actually probably the, one of the more well, probably more well known than the original. Obviously, Jimi Hendrix fantastic guitarist i'm sure i already talked about some of this stuff before after he was discharged from the army played gigs in clarksville tennessee until he earned a gig with the isley brothers backup band and then later picked up with backing up little richard before he hooked up with a woman named linda keith linda keith was the daughter of actor and dj alan keith so we wouldn't know him on this side of the pond but apparently he was kind of a big deal in britain as far as a radio personality and actor his daughter linda kind of a wild child during the 60s and she actually introduced jimmy hendrix to as chandler bassist of the animals who was jimmy's first manager so being in seattle jimmy hendrix is huge where they built a park in his honor he always hear about people going up and checking out his grave in Renton. Something that I thought was really cool is in my day job, I actually had a customer who went to school with him. Actually went to elementary school with Jimmy. Damn! The last thing I'm going to touch on is that Bob Dylan wrote the song while recovering from a motorcycle accident in between the birth of two of his kids. I I am just throwing that out there because it's going to tie in later. (laughs) So, next we are going to talk about Corey Hart and the song Blind Fake. Canadian singer, pop new wave singer, known best for his hit singles, Sunglasses at Night. He was really popular, and then he kind of fizzled out in the 90s. He had nine U.S. top 40 hit, but uh, even after he fizzled out in the U.S., he was still really big in Canada. He had 30 <laughs> Canadian top 40 hits, because that's different. <laughs> Of course it's they different. Win Grammys. It the they same. win Junos. <laughs> they win Junos. I guess he was just made. He's one of those people that was just going to be a musician, going to be a rock star. His first experience as a recording artist was at the age of 11. He sang the song Ben for Tom Jones in Miami. Around that same time, he actually recorded with Paul Inca. So already at age 11, early teens, recording with some really big names in the industry. He would go on to do a couple, comp- he would win a couple competitions, and he would actually contact Billy Joel while he was <laughs> on toward Montreal. And through that, recorded demos with Billy Joel's backup band. Those demos uh, uh, would lead him to hook up with John Astley of The Who, who produced his first album. Just from teenage to 20, just just working it, man. Just... <laughs> that album that went platinum, platinum also featured a song, the last track of the, uh, of the album, called Jenny Fay, guest star. Or Clapton. Just, yeah, keep throwing out the big names. <laughs> In the early 90s, his career kind of fizzled out. He'd end up finding a second career. He would marry an upcoming singer named Julie Mas- Massey. 
and they would have four kids. She would have her own bear in her own right. Pretty much kind of started with him writing a bunch of songs for her. Hmm. He'd also write songs for another Canadian, Celine Dion, because he never really stopped releasing albums. They were just only popular in Canada. <laughs> in 2011, he re-released some stuff yeah, and started having an online presence. So a couple interesting facts about Corey Hart. He was briefly considered for the role of Marty McFly and Back to the Future. That would have been a and, huge mistake. Yes. And he was approached to record several films, but declined because he liked to write songs himself. I want to write some song that was already written. Uh, that song mainly, Danger Zone, by Kenny Logan. <laughs> the movie Top Gun. That could have been a Corey Hart song. You're welcome, Kenny. You're welcome. We're going to jump around and we're going to go to the song Don't Need a Gun by Billy Idol. So I'm not going to spend too much time on Billy Idol because he's going to return in the episodes The Rising Son of Death and Honor Among Thieves. Billy Idol, born William Michael Albert Broad, achieved fame as a member of the punk band Generation X in the 70s. In 82, he started his solo career after moving to New York. The main songs I know Billy Idol for are White Wedding, Dancing with Myself, Rebel Yell, and of course, Money Money. But that actually is a cover song of a Tommy Jones and the uh, Shondells. Oh, interesting. So I didn't know that that was a cover. Generation X was actually the first punk band to appear on the BBC TV program, Top of the Pops. I've mentioned that in music. Several other bands who have been on there. And they also performed in the 1980 film DOA, like actually performed in the movie. I'm going to leave you with another interesting tidbit. And like I said, motorcycle accident tie in here. Billy Idol had a serious motorcycle accident in 1990. It nearly cost him his leg and it and it actually cost him some acting role. He was going <laughs> to be a major part in Oliver Stone's The Doors, but ended up only having a bit part because after the accident, he, he just couldn't handle the scene. So he, he was actually ended up getting cast as uh, Jim Morrison drinking buddy Cat. He was also supposed to be cast James Cameron Terminator 2 Judgment Day as T-1000. But because of the accident, that role went to someone else. Wow, that, that would have been weird to see him in that role. Lastly, we're going to talk about the Steve Miller Band. Why? Because I want to. <laughs> I want to make the world turn around. So that's the song. Steve Miller Band was formed in San Francisco in 1966. Mo most of their hits were in the 70s, but they're still touring today. Don't tell them that most of their hits were in the 70s. They don't believe it. I would say, John, um, that you have a specific tie to the Steve Miller Band because he's still rocking you all the way to Tacoma. <laughs> Even if it's not in Philadelphia, Atlanta, or or LA, it's really all about that Tacoma. Yes, which is <laughs> fake. And I'm gonna go I'm gonna come back to that. So but we're gonna start out by talking about Miller himself as a kid. Miller's dad was a doctor and his mom was a jazz singer, and they were very good friends. Good such good friends that they were actually the best man and maid of honor of Les Paul, the famous guitar guru, and his wife, Mary Ford. By the time he was finished college, he actually got to jam with guys like Muddy Waters, Buddy Guy, and ha and Howlin' Wolf. And it, you may not know who those names are, but I am incredibly jealous. Because those, are, those guys are <laughs> my heroes. 65, Miller actually moved to Chicago to play blues with keyboardist Barry Goldberg. He founded the Goldberg Miller Blues Band. But Steve Miller... Didn't like being the second hyphen, uh, being after the hyphen, you know, Oldberg Miller. That just didn't sound, it didn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> so in 66, he moved to San Francisco and started the Steve Miller Blues Band. <laughs> Take that, Barry. <laughs> after signing the contract, they would drop the blues and just go as a Steve Miller Band. And he would start out, it started out actually playing a gig as a backup band for Chuck Berry. Band would, end, uh, would be consisted of... James Cook on guitar, Bonnie Turner on bass, Tim Davis as the drummer, and Jim Peterman on the organ. You can't forget the organ. <laughs> so, but soon, soon after forming, Boss Skaggs would join on guitars, and actually he would be the guitarist and even occasionally the singer of the Steve Miller Band. Their third album, Brave New World, actually would feature a couple songs, Celebration and My Dark Hour, that would feature Paul McCartney 
playing drums, bass, and singing backup vocals. Apparently, Steve Miller, uh, through his evolution with the band and through his solo career, because I guess it was a solo career afterwards, even though no no one seemed to bother, no one seemed to care. <laughs> he actually had like on stage personas, starting with at the beginning he was the gangster of love, and then he became the space cowboy, and then Maurice. Followed by the Joker. Guess, guess never made it to the. Uh, what those is it, uh, those the uh, sound very familiar. <laughs> yeah, like you've heard it yeah. somewhere before. <laughs> In 2016, he was inducted. Steve Miller, him, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a solo artist. Sorry, band. <laughs> but Dominic, you were talking about rocking all the way to Tacoma on November 10th in 2011. They played a show inside Boeing's factory in Everett, Washington, to celebrate the successful delivery of the 747-8 <laughs> program, which they opened with the song "Jet Airliner." <laughs> And just to wrap everything up in a tidy little bow, I was reading the article, and it was so random. In the middle, in between their second album and their third album, there was just one line on the Wikipedia page that said, Steve Miller would break his neck and then just go on and not mention it ever again <laughs> in the rest of the article. And apparently, he broke his neck in a car, a serious car accident, the details of which we are not aware of. <laughs> so, if you have any information about this serious car accident <laughs> and what happened between 1970 and 73 in which Steve Miller broke his neck, is that the period of time when Bob Skaggs uh, was the lead singer? I, I don't know. <laughs> if, if you know, please email the show. <laughs> so <laughs> Somehow we always have a mystery to our show. Find these people. Do you yes. know the answer to this? <laughs> Once again, as you mentioned, Melissa, by the time we get to the end of the music segment, we went somewhere no one was prepared for. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode and our final thoughts on the send off to Larry Zito. All right, I'm going to kick off this week and get my final thoughts on this. As I mentioned last time, I think that they did a good job of a send-off for Zito in his character. Who he was, how they talked about him, what his passions were, how much we learned about him. I think they did a good job. Then we have the little, like, slideshow send-off in the ending credits. And so I think they did a good job of sending off John Deal from the show. But it really, really highlighted... The problems that we have with both Castillo and Crockett and how they deal with especially internal problems and how Crockett really did push for this to happen. And Melissa, you mentioned it. He never learned his lesson in this. He ends up bringing down the bad guys and everything's going to be OK, even though Zito is gone. So no one ever really learns a lesson here. All that we're left with is an incredibly sad and lonely Stan Switek. And so now every time I see him, that's all I'm going to think about. It's like, Stan, I hope everything's okay, brother. We're here for you. I know no one on the vice team seems to care about you, but we're here for you, and we're rooting for you. You're going to get out of this funk. Don't worry about it, Stan. Everything's going to be okay. Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, obviously this episode makes me sad, and I don't want to go on without Zito, and I don't want Stan to have to go on without him. <laughs> it makes me so sad every time I think about him by himself, all lonely in the bug van. Yeah, he says at the end, he's like, I still talk to him every once and in a while. And I was like, oh, God. And then <laughs> Tubbs is like, well, that, that that's right, because he was your partner. You're supposed to do that. But, or you could go in the bug van, Tubbs. <laughs> I feel it makes me sad, obviously. And uh, you all know my anger for the way Castillo acted in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope, like I said, he goes home and cries about it or something. Let's off some steam because I'm really worried about what's coming in the future if he doesn't let it all out. It just builds up. <laughs> I think it was a good send off. I think that it's don't expect anything to change. Crockett is Crockett. Crockett will continue to do what he do and he will never talk about Zito again. Mm. They want, I mean, like Zito, I mean, he is like throughout the rest of this season, it'll still be brought up. But at some point, it'll just be like he never existed. And it's sad to me that that, that that's the case that, that, that they do. They end up in that state that he's just like not a thing. Ouch. That hurts. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I agree with you, Tom. I think it was a good send off. I just wish someone would have told the cast that. Um, <laughs> I can't think that the characters were intentioned. Uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, I know with how we're talking about with Castillo and, 
and Crockett not learning his lesson and stuff. And it just didn't seem like like they cared very much after the episode got rolling. So, I mean, Stan was devastated the whole episode. The rest of the crew, eh. <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of over it. You know, and it's just uh, apparently no one was throwing him a send off party or something because uh, they didn't seem too uh, choking up about it. So <laughs> I, I think they did a good, a good job. I wish they would have done a little bit more as far as solving the case of, or at least shown us a little bit more of them proving that Zito didn't kill himself. I was kind of hoping to see a little bit more of that, but, you know, we got the little montage at the end. Uh, I definitely enjoyed all of the goofy lingo throughout the episode, the the stones of a burrito, and all, all the stuff that the guys were saying. Like, like I thought overall it was just it was it was a good episode. Guess I still need some closure, man. You know, I think they did good. I just wish, hey, maybe there was one more. But you know what though? We might feel that way forever because we don't want to see Zito go. And so just just give me one more. Yeah. Just just give me one more to some <laughs> never goes away. Well, that's gonna do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go with the Heat. This was a hard storyline for us to get through. We knew this was coming, but even knowing it wasn't prepared for how things were gonna go down and just how much we knew we were gonna miss Cedo. Still not prepared for it. We hope that you did enjoy this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about how they did John Dale Justice how this story arc went, what your thoughts are on these two episodes. We'd love to hear from you. Email us, goaltheheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out the website, goaltheheat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to contact us. We would love to hear from you. You can tweet at us, at goaltheheat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.